Hey everyone, welcome back. So today, we're going to finally be reviewing Pokemon Sword and Shield for the Nintendo Switch. Now, it's been almost a month that the game has been out, and this time period, or this wait period, is actually a voluntary one on my part. And there's actually a few reasons for that. Number one, Pokemon Sword and Shield is really a game that you can't judge after only just a few hours of gameplay. It's one of those games that it's really important, especially if you've played a lot of other Pokemon games, don't come to a conclusion whether it's a good game or not until you've actually played through a good part of the storyline and you get an idea how the game is actually set up this time around. There's actually a second reason as well I waited. Number one is right after the release of this game, there was such a huge controversy going on about this game that I didn't really want to be involved in all of that. So I really thought it was worthwhile waiting for about, you know, three weeks, a month before really putting my review in form because honestly, I just didn't want people like disliking the video just because they didn't like the game or vice versa. You know, it really wasn't worth getting involved in all of that. And as usual, we're going to be focusing also a lot on the difference in experience that you get from playing in dock mode on a traditional TV compared to be playing in handheld mode and more specifically too on the Nintendo Switch Lite. Because I really like focusing on that aspect, especially for those people out there that only own a Nintendo Switch Lite to know which kind of games what they can expect from it. So without further ado, let's start getting going on this review. And actually, just before we get started, a quick note for all of you out there. I just really, really want to thank all of you out there who's been watching my videos after over the last few months. All of you have been liking and subscribing as well because I've had a huge uptick in views and subscribes in the last few months. And I really want to keep it going. So, you know, for all of you out there who aren't subscribed already, please don't forget to subscribe to this video after this video. And, you know, at the same time, if any of you out there like this video, don't forget to like it. And if you have any questions, any comments, leave them down below, please. It really helps the channel out a lot. And I really want to keep growing all of us together. So now let's really get started on that review. Uh, and just a couple of things set straight. Uh, number one, am I disappointed that they didn't include the national decks? Yes, I am. But my whole review will not be revolving just around that one fact. Uh, number two, I'm really going to review this game, you know, focused on what the game is, not the game, what I would have wanted this game to be. And I think that that's something about Pokemon that it's really important that a lot of you out there judge the game on what it is, not what you would have liked it to be. And uh, lastly, just because I want to be super, you know, straight on the get go, I actually really like this Pokemon game. So although we might start with a couple of the downsides overall this in this game, do not worry, there are a lot of lot of positive points to this Pokemon game. And overall, I actually really like Pokemon Sword and Shield. And I just want to be clear on that because I don't want any of you tuning out after 2-3 minutes saying, hey, he didn't like the game, you know, downvoting the video or whatnot. So yes, we're starting with a couple of the things I didn't like. But don't worry, we're going to get to the stuff I did like. And there are a lot of them. So like I said, we're going to be starting with some of the things I didn't like. And sort of just to get them out of the way and you know we can just move on to stuff i did like now number one the storyline i'm gonna be honest this is probably one of my least favorite storylines of all the pokemon games that have ever come out and i think that the main reason why is because since this was a leap to the home console like it was a first mainline pokemon game it for a home console a lot of people people were expecting the storyline to become a lot bigger you know, to have a lot more depth to it and whatnot. And in, unfortunately, Game Freak decided to go in the complete other direction. Like, I find this is one of the smallest Pokemon storylines ever. Uh, the, the scenes that they set are a lot bigger. Like, the stadiums that you get into and everything feel a lot bigger. But the storyline itself is actually very, very simplistic. I mean, there's actually less twists in this storyline, in my opinion, than in the original Pokemon Red and Blue that we got here in North America. Like, basically, there is no twists until the very end. And don't worry, I won't be spoiling it to anyone, but you pretty much start out getting your first Pokemon from your best friend's big brother, who just happens to be also be the Pokemon champion. You set out on an adventure because you also get his endorsement to join the Pokemon League. And from there on out, you pretty much go from one gym to the other, and then you get to the end game. And yes, there is a lot of side things you can actually do 
in the game, but they're optional. If we're talking about storyline wise, you basically go from one gym to another with almost no twists and turns throughout the whole storyline. And unfortunately, I found that a little bit disappointing because I really thought Game Freak was going to take this occasion to make a huge storyline being the first jump to a home console. But like I said, there, I later on we're going to get to the reason why I think they actually did this, but at the same time, it is one of the weaker points of the game. And now we're going to get to the second point which annoyed me about Pokemon Sword and Shield, which is the interactions with your rival. Uh, basically, I really feel like there are too many in this game to the point where it actually, by the end of the game, you sort of get annoyed by interacting with your rival. Like, there's a lot of rival battles in this in this game. Like, if you like rival battles, like fighting the same person over and over again, uh, you're gonna love Pokemon Sword and Shield. Me personally, I would have liked a little bit less interaction with your rival um, because honestly, at some points, it's like you really can't go five steps without this guy getting involved in your storyline and not in an interesting way that evolves the plot just like sort of the same interactions over and over again where he's way hyperactive and way too into it and you're just sort of like okay dude yeah sure we'll have a battle and let's move on like that's really the feeling i got while playing this game and uh, the it also evolves into other characters like i find that there are points in the game where it's hard to do five steps without having a forced interaction with a character from the game. But once again, they're not interesting interactions which really evolve the storyline or the plotline majorly. It's more like, okay, can I just stop talking to you to sort of, you know, get on with the storyline because what you're telling me isn't super interesting. And that's the feeling I got from the game, so be ready for it. Like when you're moving through the storyline, at some point it sort of gets you know, heavy in the interruptions by, forced interruptions by different characters, basically. And now lastly, we're gonna tackle the Waylord-sized elephant in the room. No, the National Dex is not part of Pokemon Sword and Shield for the moment. There are rumors that maybe more Pokemon will be added later on, but for any of you out there that are not, you know, current with Pokemon lingo, what that basically means is not every Pokemon that has existed in every Pokemon game is available for the moment in Pokemon Sword and Shield. They basically selected a selection of Pokemon that are available for the moment, which adds up to a little bit over 400 Pokemon, which is, you know, roughly a little bit less than or a little bit more than half the Pokemon that have ever existed. And basically what that means is that if you are a person who is particularly attached to one specific Pokemon or one specific group of Pokemon, it's important that you maybe consult which Pokemons are in this game before getting started, just so that you don't get hyper disappointed that, you know, your favorite isn't there and without him being there, your whole experience is ruined. I particularly am disappointed by this point, but like I said, I'm not going to ditch the game just because of that one point. Uh, Look, me personally, am I super disappointed, and spoilers out there, am I super disappointed that Bulbasaur isn't part of the game, which is technically my favorite Pokemon of all time? Yes, I am super disappointed, but at the same time, I did manage to enjoy the game a lot nonetheless, so I think that some people, you know, inflated this issue. And who knows down the line, like I said, there are rumors that Game Freak will be adding more Pokemon, so this actually might be addressed later on. Okay, so now we got a lot of the bad stuff out of the way. So let's get moving on to some of the good stuff, because there's a lot of it in this game. And the first I want to really point out, and this is probably going to be an unpopular opinion, because a lot of people have been, you know, sort of targeting this in the game, but I actually really like the graphics. Are they the best I've ever seen of a Switch game? And I, and I talked about this in my first impressions video. No, they aren't. But Pokemon has never been about being the game with the best graphics overall. To me, I'm looking at the fact that, is this a huge step up from the graphics we had on the 3DS? Yes, it is. It's a huge step up. Could they maybe animate some more of the Pokemon? Undoubtedly, they could have. And, you know, maybe they'll put patches in where we'll be getting additional animations. Or maybe that's just going to be a next step in Game Freak's process and it's going to be in next year's game. But overall, if we compare what we had in the 3DS to what we got in Pokemon Sword and Shield, 
It is actually a huge step up in graphics and overall visual experiences. And you should be seeing on the screen a few comparisons. Like, come on, it, it's a huge step up. But I do agree. Could they have put it, maybe put a little bit more effort specifically into those trees in the wild area? Yes, they could have. But overall, it's a huge step up. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I've rather counted as a positive point to this game to a negative point in this game. And that's actually going to bring us to one of the first points where I think that this game really shines even stronger on a Switch Lite compared to the traditional Switch. Now, why do I say this, that it's better on the Switch Lite? Well, you're right. Some of the graphics being less than stellar, if you blow it up on a 50-inch screen, it makes them look even a little bit worse. But that's pretty much true for every game, and it's not only true for Pokemon. There are a lot of games out there that when you play in dock mode on a huge screen, because the resolution on the Nintendo Switch is lower than some other consoles, of course the graphics are going to be looking a little bit dated. However, when you translate this game to the Switch Lite specifically with the smaller screen but the denser screen, I find this game actually looks really, really nice. And I really like my experience with it on the Nintendo Switch Lite more specifically. And don't forget, Game Freak is a developer that has always been developing almost exclusively for portable consoles. And they're not gonna drop those habits after just one game. Which means that I think that Pokemon Sword and Shield, if you're going to experience it for the first time, experience it in handheld mode or in, you know, on a Switch Lite, for example, you're actually going to probably get away with a more pleasing experience than if you play through the whole game only in dock mode. And you're going to see this as something that's going to come back often in my review because I really think that the overall experience for this game is better off being experienced in handheld or on a Switch Lite. Now, by keeping on the theme of visuals, what I actually really liked, although some of the moves were not so animated, you can see that Game Freak really put an emphasis on the individual moves that the Pokemon get in their final evolution states. You'll see that basically most of the Pokemon out there that have multiple evolutions, their final evolution will have a dedicated move to that Pokemon, and those, Game Freak has actually put in a little more time animating more than the average move. And it's a really smart move on their part. Because if you think about it, how much of the game does your Pokemon spend in its first form compared to its last form? The reality is that most of the game, or most of the gameplay, especially in the case of Pokemon Sword and Shield, you're going to be spending with your Pokemon evolved in its last form. So it's maybe more sense that they took more time animating the moves that the Pokemon will be using in that final form than in its initial form. And I'll let you experience it for yourself, not to ruin too much or spoil too much, but you'll see pretty much every Pokemon has an individual move and the animations for that move is actually quite more animated than, you know, most of the other moves you'll get throughout the game and it's really really fun because a lot of these moves actually look quite stellar. Now we get to a point that is actually a direct parallel to what we talked about earlier. I said the storyline was one of the weak points of this game and I stand by that but the end game of Pokemon Sword and Shield is among my favorites so far and my statistics proved it. The game came out last month and it's my most played game in 2019. Not because I ran through the storyline a couple of times, because I spent so much time in that end game. And honestly, that is the shining point of Pokemon Sword and Shield. And at the same time, I think it explains why Game Freak did such a simplistic storyline. A lot of people over the years have complained that, you know, the whole point of a Pokemon game is getting to the end game and it sometimes takes too long to get to that end game to really enjoy it. Well, I think Pokemon, you know, and Game Freak sort of took that to heart. And what they did is they simplified the storyline, but to my taste, a little bit too much so that you can really get to that end game as soon as possible and start enjoying what Pokemon Sword and Shield is really about. Now, what do I mean about that end game? Well, the first major point of the end game is the wild area. You actually get access to it pretty early in the game. Like almost from the get go, you have access to this wild area. And for any of you out there that has no idea what I'm talking about, the wild area, imagine a safari zone that you have access to from the beginning of the game. 
And it's a Safari Zone where I would say over 70% of the overall Pokemon in the game are available in that one zone. However, it's divided into sectors, meaning that each sector will have different Pokemon, and they also vary based on the time of day and also the weather conditions. So you won't be able to poke, catch every Pokemon every day at any moment. And when I say you can catch a lot of Pokemon, I mean you can catch even evolved Pokemon. Like a Machamp can be catched in the wild area, meaning that you don't actually have to evolve a Machoke and then trade it with a friend to get a Machamp in this game. You can actually catch it right out in the wild area. That's how open it is. And honestly, this is one of the best ideas and additions of Pokemon Sword and Shield because most of the end game will be spent in this wild area. And if you want a little hint or some advice, don't spend too much time during the main storyline because a lot of the Pokemon you won't be able to catch till you finish that main storyline. And secondly, the Pokemon will be much higher level once you get to the end game. So don't waste too much time in the wild area during the storyline, just finish the game and come back when you're at the end game. It actually would have saved me a lot of time to know that before I started my first playthrough. And when I'm talking about a full end game, I'm not talking only about this wild area. I mean, in this game, they really put a lot of emphasis on what you can do once you finish the storyline. For example, shiny hunting. Yes. This Pokemon game has shiny versions of every Pokemon, except the legendaries, pretty much, that you can catch throughout the game, and you can actually go hunting for them. Now, we're not going to go into the whole process of shiny hunting. There's a lot of videos out on YouTube if you guys want to see what you can do. But a lot of people are putting hours and hours of time into catching shiny versions of their favorite Pokemon, getting, you know, perfect IV Pokemon. And they've actually made it a lot easier this time around. As long as you put the hours in, you can pretty much get a perfect IV Pokemon of pretty much anyone that's in the game. And honestly, that is a huge, huge, huge advantage in Pokemon Sword and Shield compared to previous Pokemon games, where getting perfect IV Pokemon or getting you know special versions of the Pokemon were actually quite difficult. It's actually quite pleasing to have as long as you're willing to put the hours in, an easy way of getting these things. And if that wasn't addictive enough at this point, then we've got Gigantamax Pokemon. And this, I think, at first, I thought it wasn't going to be such a huge point about the game, but it actually ended up being a really, really positive point about the game. What are Gigantamax Pokemon? Well, Pretty much, if you've seen any preview of Pokemon, you can see that your Pokemon can get huge in this game, what's called Dynamaxing. But some Pokemon have a trait that's called Gigantamaxing. What that means is not only does your Pokemon get bigger, but it changes visually and gets new moves that other Pokemon, even of the same type, don't have access to. And what Game Freak is doing is they're actually releasing different Gigantamax Pokemon as we advance through time or making certain Pokemon more available between certain periods. Meaning that Pokemon Sword and Shield is going to keep you coming back and back and back to really collect all these different Gigantamax Pokemons. And that's actually really a, a really interesting part, especially that they're doing it free of charge. It's not like they're charging you for loot boxes or anything. They're doing these updates and these, you know, variable Gigantamax Pokemon free of charge. And a lot of people are thinking that this is how they're going to be adding in the extra Pokemon through special events to keep people coming back and back to Sword and Shield, which is actually really fun because that means that even six months down the road, you actually might have something new to do in Pokemon, which is maybe one of the first times ever that that's going to happen. And that brings me to another one of the reasons why I think that this game is also best experienced on the Switch Lite or on in handheld mode which is basically the way it's been set up. Having to do just a few hours here and there to catch every Pokemon, go Gigantamax hunting, you know, go shiny hunting when you've got a couple of free minutes, it really makes it a lot easier to do when you can carry around your Switch Lite or, you know, play your Nintendo Switch in handheld mode, where a couple of minutes before going to bed, you do a couple of batches of Pokemon trying to catch that shiny, or, you know, if you're on a break at work and you have access to your Wi-Fi, you can go, you know, you can do a couple of batches there. You can try to catch a Gigantamax Pokemon, check what 
dens you have access to that day. It makes actually the form factor or the way they set up this game, I find, really prioritizes the Nintendo Switch in handheld mode or in, you know, on the Nintendo Switch Lite. I mean, can you do all these things on your television set? Yes, but you know, with real life happening, a lot of people are gonna want that portability factor to be able to do a few minutes here, a few minutes there. Like traditionally, everyone has been doing on every Pokemon game since the start of time. And I think that Game Freak, you know, like I said, it's gonna take them a couple of generations to lose that handheld first mentality and make a really, really dedicated, you know, home console Pokemon game. But overall, I don't think that was even what they were aiming for this time. Is it a huge upside that you can play on a television set? And do those Gigantamax Pokemon look awesome on a 50-inch screen? Because that, they put a lot of time into the animation. Yes, they do look very awesome on a huge screen. But overall, the whole process of catching them, of going shiny hunting and whatnot, really is much more convenient when you play in handheld mode or, like I said, with a Switch Lite on the go, than it is to play in dock mode on a television set. And now we get to the last really positive point about this series, which is the quality of life upgrades they've done. This game could almost be called the quality of life Pokemon series, because basically they focused on, I think, changing some of the things that a lot of people have been complaining about over the years. Number one, Random battles is purely a choice now because you can see the Pokemon from the overworld and you can choose if you want to get around those random battles or get, you know, or actually have them. Obviously, if you're going to want to catch Pokemon, you're going to need these random battles. And if you want to, you know, level your Pokemon quicker, you're going to use these random battles. But ultimately, if you want to just fight trainers, you could in this Pokemon game. And that makes a lot of sections of the game a lot more pleasant especially going through caves like you know traditionally in every pokemon game a lot of people hated the cave sections and in this pokemon game they become actually quite pleasant like any other part of the map secondly quality of life upgrade we don't have any hms we don't need to teach any pokemon moves to get access to different sections even the fly mechanic has been changed you basically get access to the pokemon taxi and at that point in the game, you can fly to any area you've been to before and you don't need to have a Pokemon that knows a specific move to have access to that. Same thing for getting through water. There's no longer a necessity to have surf. Once you get your bicycle upgrade, your bicycle can roll on water and you have access to your bicycle at any point in the game, meaning that basically you can surf through water at any point. And these are things that people have been asking for for a long time. Even the whole breeding process has been made a lot quicker. You get eggs all very, very quickly in this game, and they actually, they actually hatch a lot quicker, which is why I said that, that whole shiny hunting thing is really, really popular and has become, as long as you're willing to put the hours in, something that is actually very realistic in this game. And even XP share is available from the get-go. You don't need a special item. Basically, every Pokemon in your party, whether they participated into battles or not, will be sharing XP as long as they're in your active party, which is, once again, a sort of huge upgrade. And you can even send your Pokemon on what's called Pokemon jobs from any Pokemon center, meaning they'll be able to get levels and experience even uh, when you're they're not in your party in this game. So it's all really quality of life upgrades, meaning that if you get that Pokemon in the end game, you haven't used it at all throughout the game, well, if you've amassed enough candies, you can actually get it from level 0 to 100, like, five minutes after you get that Pokemon. Like, straight out. Now, some people like these upgrades, some people didn't like these upgrades, but overall, it, they are quality of life upgrades. And I think that overall, more people like them than are going to dislike them, or at least you'll get used to them, and you'll get used to the idea behind them. Because overall, Pokemon, the idea behind them is that it's become more a grind for the fun stuff than a grind for those stuff that we were used to. You know, you pick up that Pokemon that isn't available till the late game, so you have it, it's not obviously at the same level as the rest of your party, and you gotta waste 10 hours getting it to the level that the rest of your party is at to be able to use it. 
Well, that was boring. However, shiny hunting is sort of really, really addictive. So if you want to really grind through this game, there's a lot to grind, but you grind for the fun stuff rather than the necessary stuff. Now, overall, I think that summarizes pretty well all the really good points about the game and also some of the bad points about it. But I think ultimately what you have to keep in mind is Pokemon is never going to be a game that will be perfectly tailored to each individual person. The reason why is because Pokemon has to please such a huge range of age groups. Think about it. Pokemon is a game that has to be pleasant for a six-year-old that their parents decide to pick it up for him and that he's never played a Pokemon game before, him or her. At the same time, it also has to play please the 30-year-old something gamer like myself that has been playing Pokemon since the beginning. I mean, that is an impossibility to have the perfect scenario for both of those gamers. And it has to please every person in between because Pokemon is pretty much the biggest franchise on the planet. And the reason why is because it actually attracts people from all those different age groups. But how do you please all of them with the perfect game? I think you, you, there's no way to really please all of them with the perfect game. So what that means is that every time Game Freak comes out with a new game, they have to balance it so that the newcomer likes it, but the person that has been playing it since the beginning also finds something new. And that's sort of like a death sentence for a developer. There's no way they're going to make everyone 100% happy. But overall, I think that this is a step in the right direction. Is it maybe going to take Game Freak a couple of more tries before they get a more generally accepted version of a home console Pokemon? Most likely. But in the meantime, I think that if you're experiencing it on the Switch Lite or the handheld, you're going to really like this game. If you played in dock mode, you're going to love it as well. But I think it's really one of those games that is better experienced than still in handheld mode. Just because, like I said, it's going to take a couple of more tries before Game Freak really shakes off those handheld first, you know, directions to its games. But let me know what you guys think down below. Did you guys like the game? Do you agree with the points that I brought up that were good points versus bad points? Let me know in the comments down below. Let's talk about it and you know what, maybe we'll come back with a second video to discuss those points. Because I think Pokemon is a big enough game that over time we're going to want to be updating maybe the thoughts about it. Anyway, let me know down below. Like I said earlier, don't forget to like and subscribe if you aren't already. Hit that notification bell as well. I'm going to be leaving affiliate links down below in the description as well if you want to pick up the games because you haven't already. If you use those affiliate links, helps the channel out, doesn't cost you anything extra. So, you know, why not use them? And at the same time, as usual, I just want to thank you all a lot for watching. And I hope I'll catch you guys in my next video.